Hi. Um, yeah, Western Carolina University is just over the mountains. It's only a two-hour drive from here, but I'm really excited to be here. I've enjoyed talking with a lot of you um, in the last uh, day. So what, what I'm going to do today is, first off, we have a lot of mathematicians in the room, and so I need to define the words in my title, right? <laughs> so first off, a fractal. A fractal is an irregular shape that looks the same on any scale at which it's examined. And no, I'm not using a deep definition. This is the kid's definition out of Webster's. But that's applicable for the rest of this talk. Um, we will see self-similarity in the talk. In other words, keep, we'll see reappearing themes going on and on. Um, and uh, well, let's see here. You've probably seen fractals. That's, that picture looks familiar. There's the Mandelbrot set, and there's a Julia set. Um, and they're self-similar in the sense that if you zoom in on any of those edges, you'll start seeing the same picture over and over again. Um, and they're really cool if you start zooming in. You even get little baby Mandelbrot sets. This right here looks like a Mandelbrot set if you zoom in closer. Um, but I'm also going to be more general, right? Because broccoli is self-similar. If you look at that picture, you don't know if it's a big, three big heads of broccoli or three little pieces of broccoli because they're self-similar. Okay, so life. Life is, that was in the title, right? It's the ability to grow, change, et cetera, that separates plants <laughs> and animals from things like rocks and water. Um, <laughs> so, um, and what I'll be talking about today is really my career path. And there definitely has been a lot of growth and change and adapting, which actually goes along with the biology, too. Um, and of course, it's also a board game created by Mil Milton Bradley. But <laughs> But um, all right, so what in the world am I um, planning to share with you in the next half hour? Um, a mathematical life can be self-similar. And, and what you'll see is some reappearing themes of things that I do, reappearing people that just keep re-popping up. <laughs> <laughs> people I haven't seen in forever are here, which is awesome. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of growth and change and self-similarity. And in some sense, it's a fractal then. Um, and my research area is related to fractals. So, <laughs> um, my research area, if I go back to when I was in graduate school, I got my PhD at UNC Chapel Hill. And I did a cross between complex dynamical systems and ergodic theory. So complex dynamical systems just means that you're looking at how functions change over time. You iterate over and over again. And your domain is the complex numbers. Um, and ergodic theory is a branch of math that works on invariant measures and looks at those iterated functions and sees what happens over time. So you can talk about how chaotic they are and how points scatter all over the place or whether they come back and that, that sort of thing. And yeah, Wikipedia. So we're, we're not talking about deep definitions at the moment. But, um, and then the other word that was in my title is Julia. <laughs> Even though it's completely unrelated to an actual Julia set that was named after a French mathematician um, over 100 years ago, but that was his last name. Um, but a filled Julia set is the collection of points that are bounded under iteration. So you look at the whole domain space and you look at points and see which ones, if you iterate over and over again, do you get big or do you get small? Um, and then a Julia set would be the boundary of the filled Julia set. Um, so for example, if I look at z squared, if you take anything inside the unit circle, um, the radius is less than 1. And when you start iterating, it'll get smaller and shrink towards 0. So it is bounded. If you take things that are outside, they have a radius greater than 1 and will iterate away. So those are not in the filled Julia set. And points on the edge stay on the edge. The Julia set would actually be the edge. And that's about the most boring Julia set you can look at. <laughs> However, you can compute it by hand. <laughs> Um, yeah, here's another one, and this one's really pretty, where you can zoom in on the edges and you get infinite lace. Um, there's definitely an infinite number of those little loops in there. Um, and z squared plus i, the Julia set's in the middle of all of this. It's a lightning bolt kind of shape. Um, and then here's an example of one that's not quadratic. So um, just to get you an idea, it's similar to the one we had a minute ago. But um, all right. So when I was in graduate school, I was using ergodic theory to talk about how chaotic Julia sets were when they were the entire domain. So not just the edge of these lace little uh, you know, lacy pictures. My Julia sets actually were boring looking because they would be the entire domain, literally. Um, 
<coughs> but you could think of it as the complex plane or the Riemann sphere where you, you do a one-to-one -one correspondence between everything on the plane and the sphere and then you put infinity at, at the North Pole. So I like hands-on things, I even did in grad school, and when I was doing research talks, especially if it was a general audience or my job talk, I had a punch ball with me because I could hold up my punch ball and say, this is my domain space, this is my entire Julia set, and here's what points are doing, and I used a Sharpie and drew on the, on the ball, and you could see what I was doing. Um, <laughs> and the punch balls are round, I mean, balloons aren't perfect spheres, so this was great, and I'd bring out the punch ball. Um, so, um, I attended a lot of conferences, and those of you in, in grad school should be doing that and getting your name out, and several things happened. Uh, one was, um, I was giving a talk, and John Meyer, who's at the University of Alabama at Birm Birmingham, asked me for a preprint. I'm like, oh, great, somebody actually is interested in my work, this is good. Um, <laughs> and two years later, actually, I noticed he was in the program at a conference. And I went to his talk, and lo and behold, all these slides had my name on it. He was using my results, and he, he um, gave me copies of some papers where he used my results. I'm like, this is a, a, amazing. You know, so um, I've seen him over the years. He's a really nice guy. Um, I went to an AWM workshop, and I did one of the poster sessions. And because I like my hands on things, I had ping pong balls glued to the poster because I wanted to be able to point to it and say, here's my domain, and here's what happened. And Tom Pulaski was, um, he'd, he was like in his second year at Winthrop, which is a very teaching-focused school, and I knew I was interested in teaching, I was interested in research, but he was drawn to my poster because of the ping pong balls, and started asking me questions about it, and I started asking questions about his job, and, and I'm like, oh, so what is your job like, and what's it like to work there, and how do, how do you look for people? And he'd just been on the hiring committee. How useful. <laughs> and he gave me a ton of great advice that I could get a different perspective than I, than I could hear it in R1 school about a teaching position. And he offered to read all of my job application materials, which was amazing. Um, so I took him off of, up on the offer, and, and he gave me great feedback. Um, I went to a conference in England, and a heavy math research talks, and um, Kathleen Madden was another recent graduate, and she had just been involved in Project Next, which is, um, I'll say a little bit more about in a minute, but she was in the first group that ever went through Project Next, so I'd never heard of it, and that's how I found out about it, was at a research conference, and she said, oh, you should look into Project Next. I'm like, oh, okay, I will. Um, I also worked closely with my mathematical sister, so um, she was a year behind me, and we went to conferences together, we did similar research projects, we practiced our talks on each other, um, and so we've been in touch over the years as well. And I also became really good friends with my office mates, um, and Beth Shawbrook will come up again later in the talk as well. Uh, Kim and I are still good friends too, I'm actually her oldest daughter's godmother, but we, <laughs> we haven't done any math together lately. <laughs> um, all right, so I was on the job market, and. My first interview was actually at Western Carolina University. That's uh, a picture of the campus. And my biggest hobby is hiking. Do you see that this might be a good place for me? <laughs> uh, I also um, was very interested in teaching and doing my research. And so I you know, had that in mind while I was looking there. Uh, it's a regional comprehensive university, which means they do some of everything, part of the state system. and. Um, so after I gave my talk, somebody came up and asked me this. May we borrow your punch ball? Remember, of course I used my punch ball <laughs> as a prop in a research talk. Um, but they wanted to toss it over a motion sensor and see if it made a good parabolic arc. Because they were looking for examples for pre-calculus. And I'm thinking, okay, I think <laughs> this might work for me. <laughs> because I really knew that they valued teaching they liked doing hands-on things, you know, they appreciated my research, but at the same time, they, they were willing to go experiment in class. Um, so I thought these were all good things. Um, they actually called to offer me the job while I was mid-sentence telling my roommate how much I liked the place. Um, <laughs> and I immediately asked for funding for Project Next. Um, which, um, so what is, let me see if I, yeah. So what is Project Next? 
It stands for New Experiences in Teaching, and it started in um, 1994. It was originally created by Chris Stevens and Jim Lysel, and the first groups were about 60 fellows. Now they take about 80 a year. But um, it's a professional development program that covers all aspects of the career. So what is it? Like I said, professional development program, we have participants that are at small teaching schools, we have people in postdocs, we have everything in between. And you have to be in your first two years of a full-time job, um, but you can still be a postdoc. Um, and you attend three national meetings together. So you go to the summer math fest, and you go early, you go three days before math fest, and then you go to the joint meetings in January, and then you go to math fest again um, before it starts. And during that time, you cover a lot of information that's, that's useful, um, anywhere from here's cool teaching ideas to here's how to look for grants, a lot of the same kinds of things we're talking about here. Right? So any aspect of balance of teaching and research, how to deal with service load, any, anything that could come up in the profession can be discussed. Um, but I also met an amazing cohort of colleagues. And even at that time, I was sitting there thinking, wow, these people are wonderful. I am going to want to like, remember them. And this was pre-cell phone, pre-digital cameras, but I had a camera with me and, with film. You know? <laughs> like ancient history. This was 1996. Um, and I took pictures of all of the group. So there were 60 of us. This is half of them. Um, that's me right there in 1996. Um, but just to think of the future, let's see, Helen Moore is right here. She's sitting in the back. <laughs> I did warn her that I had a picture of her. <laughs> uh, let's see, this is Francis Sue. He's president-elect of the National MAA. Um, and here's Tensia. She is currently associate treasurer of the National MAA. Um, and this is Chris Stevens back then, so those of you who knew her. Um, one of the two creators of the program. Um, and any other, there's probably other people you may have seen, some of you who are... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, she does math ed. That's uh, TJ, TJ Murphy. And she's very much math ed. So, yeah, we, we take the gamut. And, in fact, we actually pride ourselves on diversity. So we want a lot of things. Okay, and so that's, that's the rest of the group. Um, anyway. All right, so for me, at that time, um, I needed Project Next because I needed confidence. I had major imposter syndrome. I thought I was never going to get through this career. Didn't matter that I had the PhD. I didn't know how I got through that. Um, but it, it really gave me confidence to meet other faculty and to know other people going through the same thing I was going through. Um, and so those were people I could contact. I mean, I had great colleagues. I could walk down the hall. But sometimes it was just really nice to ask somebody who's not at my university um, just for other ideas. Um, and it also got me involved in the section. Um, our, the, I'm in the southeast section, just a couple hours from here. And um, I was organizing neat teaching ideas sessions for the um, section next. Um, so most, well, at least over half of the MA sections have a section next program. And each one is a little bit different. But we have an active one in the southeast. And I also was one of the um, co-organizers for section next uh, for three years. And section next are very much like the national program. They're smaller versions, and they're modified to deal with the needs of that section. So um, it's, it's more open on who can apply. You don't have to be in your first two years. Um, for Southeast, um, you can apply if you're just simply pre-tenure. Um, and then some of the smaller sections, like Rhode Island, it includes community college people. So um, it totally depends on the section. And currently, I'm the liaison between National Next and Section Next, so if you're interested about specific sections, you can let me know and I can look up what I know at least about that section. <laughs> um, but when I first started my job, my biggest fear was that publication thing. Like, I'm never going to be able to publish. I was really down on myself. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but anyway. But the idea is just do it anyway. And the first thing you wanted to do was publish your dissertation. And in my case, it took three tries. And it wasn't because it was awful. It was because I sent them to the wrong journals. And once I sent it to the third journal, I had glowing referees reports, and I hadn't changed the paper. I just simply had sent it to the wrong place. 
So if that's happening to you, don't, don't get down on yourself. Just, oh wait, what did I do here? Well, maybe it fits better over here. Um, but you've done the work. You've got your PhD. You, you should be able to publish it. Um, I also did some work with my mathematical sister. She had actually extended some of my results, so we were able to get a paper out of that that was, you know, the beginning of it was the things I had done, and the, the end of it was her extension of it. Um, I also published a paper with a friend of my advisor. His name was Stanley Eigen, which is a, a great math name. <laughs> <laughs> he also gave me an Erdős number. <laughs> uh, Erdős, uh, if he, he published a paper with somebody who published a paper with Erdős. Um, and then, uh, so now it's, if you, so I've published a paper with somebody who published a paper who published a paper with Erdős. Yeah, it's like the, the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I was worried about publications, and at our university, they, they care that it is peer-reviewed. So you need peer-reviewed publications. Um, but we don't rank journals, and it's not so much where you publish, as, as long as it's peer-reviewed, gets the name of the university out there. Somebody thinks you did good work and published it, so that's good. Right? And then when it gets out of, if your tenure document is going up the lines to the, the university committee, they don't know your area. They start counting. So you just want <laughs> the number of publications. So um, I also published in um, um, the North Carolina Council for Teachers of Mathematics publication. That was one of my first ones. And at least it made me calm down. I had a paper. <laughs> right? And then once I relaxed, I could produce more. So I, knowing myself, I was panicking, and then I can't produce. And so hey, I got a paper. We're good. Um, and I published a couple of articles in the Mathematics Teacher, which is geared towards high school. Oh, no, that's, <laughs> no, no, isn't that awesome? I saw that picture and I'm like, okay, I've got to use this one. But no, that one's not me. Um, but I did publish a couple of articles there related to pre-calculus because they teach that in high school. And um, I also published in Primus, which stands for uh, Problems, Resources, and Issues in Mathematics Undergraduate Studies. Um, that's a picture of Brian Winkle. He was the originator of Primus, and he was the editor for 30 years. Um, <laughs> he's retired recently and stepped down from it. But real person. All of these journals have real people editing them, and you can actually ask them questions. Um, and he was very helpful as an editor back then. Um, I also did some programs in the summer um, that sort of, a lot of what I did was an opportunity arose and I took it. So I was asked to help with the Earth Science Stream Hydrology Group for Summer Ventures. Um, it's, a, it's sort of like doing a research experience for undergraduates, except they were high school students. Um, they lived on campus for four weeks. And there was a math group, but it was the science group that invited me. And honestly, the math group stayed inside all day. <laughs> I got to play in a creek and get paid for it. <laughs> so this was great. Um, and I was teaching introductory statistics with them with no tests, no homework, and no grading, which is great, except then there's the flip side of how do I do something that is going to be that something that they can use and remember. So it had to be a lot of hands-on. It, it really changed the way I had to think about how I was teaching. Um, so it was actually a very good growth experience at the same time. But I loved working outside with them. These were smart kids. Um, and of course, notice they are alive even though they are sitting on the rock and their feet is in the water. <laughs> um, remember the definition of life? Um, all right, so I've also taught freshman seminars, and that was to appease university requirements. They needed people to teach freshman seminars, and they don't count as math credits at all, and they have no prereqs. So that makes it fun trying to do things. So that's where the broad definition of fractals come in. And uh, we actually built, uh, this is a Sierpinski tetrahedron with um, toothpicks and marshmallows. I had to let the marshmallows sit out for a week and dehydrate a little so that they would stick together. And we took that picture very quickly before it collapsed. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, we would do paper folding. This is a, a copy of Jurassic Park, which if you, has anybody seen that book? The actual book, not the movie. <laughs> it has units in it, and the front of each unit is a fractal that's being built as you go through. And you can create that fractal with paper folding. So we did the paper folding here. And, and remember the kindergarten thing where you put, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, well we did that in class and students actually loved it. But then we went through and, and analyzed the fractal structure of it. So 
It was, it was a great day. But uh, a different way of thinking about teaching. I also run a student treasure hunt for the Southeast section the day before the MAA meeting. And uh, I've been doing it for like 10 years. It's, it's um, a couple hours of students doing activities, collecting clues, and they get to a treasure. So it's definitely just a service activity, but I love doing it. And the activities we're doing are things that I do in class. So um, not always, but sometimes. This is they're building uh, Solids of Revolution with Play-Doh. Um, here there's a 3D axis system in the room, and they're acting out what would a plane look like. And they were given an equation, and they had to be it. Um, here they're graphing a function and its derivative with feather boas. And here they are doing transitions of functions with feather boas. Um, and you know when you do feather boas, they want to touch it, and so they all want to participate. It's great. Um, when they do it in class, we go out in the hallway, and the history faculty have to jump over us, and they laugh at it. And, you know, but they're all participating. <laughs> and I can see what they're doing. And then, and then here they're like, they got clues that tell them to walk 10 paces, turn right, whatever. So, and then they end up at the, wherever the, the treasure is. Um, <clears throat> I've continued to develop new teaching ideas in classes, and anytime you do something new, you should share it, even if, and this is actually those of you planning on teaching um, positions. Um, our section next had a, set, uh, had a, a um, neat teaching ideas session, so I would share things there. Um, I'd give talks at MAA meetings. My university will fund me to go to a conference if I'm speaking, and a teaching talk is perfectly legitimate. So I would give a teaching talk at, a, at an MAA meeting. I've done workshops at my university for non-mathematicians, and I'd bring in the feather boas and find a way to relate it to their subject. So <laughs> whatever works. Um, I published in Primus, and the mathematics teacher, which I said earlier, I've continually stayed with um, Primus. And the Air Force Academy came up because one of my office mates in graduate school, Beth, that was mentioned on an earlier slide, um, is a civilian teaching at the Air Force Academy. And so I would go visit her, and while I was there, I, oh, you want me to do a workshop? OK. So I would do a teaching workshop for the Air Force Academy while I was there. <laughs> And it would be uh, hands-on teaching ideas. So here he's, um, um, you know, solid revolution with Play-Doh. We've got, you know, the feather boas. And that, they are representing a, a parabolic cylinder with their hands. And the, there is the 3D axis system hanging up in there. It's hard to see in that picture. So, um, but yeah, they, so I've, I've done several workshops for them every few years when I go visit Beth. Um, and then because people knew I was doing this sort of thing, one of the sterling dots and dot color has to do with what year of Project Next you're in, um, knew what I was doing. And so he invited me to be on a panel for Project Next. And during our Project Next workshops, we have the fellows um, actually create, organize some panel discussions so that they get used to how to be in the math community and put together a workshop. And so one of them invited me to be on a panel and um, on teaching ideas, hands-on teaching ideas. And I don't know if any of you know these names, but um, yeah, well, I mean the younger people. <laughs> so I didn't know who the other panelists were until like the last minute. <laughs> and then I noticed that there were two big names on the panel with me, and I panicked. But <laughs> I um, presented anyway. And because of that pre presentation, the Project Next leadership team saw that and said, oh, well, we would like you to come and do that, uh, do a full workshop for us within the Project Next. Um, or it's not a workshop, it was a 75-minute breakout during the Project Next workshop. I'm like, well, OK. So here we're doing that again. <laughs> We've got, um, here's fellas doing that um, parabolic cylinder. This is a, <clears throat> a paraboloid with yarn. So they're holding uh, the yarn. It would be kind of like the wire mesh on your computer. And when we do that, I mean, I would only do it with y equals x squared plus y squared because then you don't see it after that. But um, you can set, they can say, oh, I, I see this computer image. This makes sense because I remember when I was standing in the room holding the yarn. That's the wire mesh. And I remember where I was standing and what I did. Um, here I'm holding a football with toothpicks in it. And if you hold it to the side, you can see the way the toothpicks change. And that's a, a visual representation of um, a mixed partial. So uh, anyway, so that, that's just some examples of what I was doing there. Um, and then because of my involvement, and I did several of those workshops for several years, when Chris Stevens stepped down, they asked me to join the Project Next team. Um, so that was my initial um, introduction into being on the team. This is the original group. Actually, that's the original group. The Peach 11 dots gave us 11 peach roses. And Chris Stevens is the first one that put it in the mouth. But <laughs> so we were just being silly. But um, anyway. 
<laughs> in the meantime, I did still continue to publish, and I have still done complex dynamics and ergodic theory, certainly not at the level I did as a graduate student. But um, I did some research with my PhD advisor that was completely different from what he'd done earlier. It was like eight years later. Um, I had written several survey articles, and what that means is you take a, a math topic and you write it at a level that an undergrad could understand. So it's not new math, but it's math that's not out in the general public. And um, so those were in the math magazine. And I started doing work with Beth Shawbrook, my office mate from grad school. So a little more on that. One of those survey articles was called the Ergodic Theory Carnival. And what we did is we took ergodic theory topics and we put them in a setting of a carnival, like a carousel and a taffy pull, and we related all of the definitions to these, these objects. And we wrote it. This is the first line of the paper. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, come one, come all, to see the amazing sights of our ergodic theory carnival. This is a math paper. <laughs> and there is serious math in it. There is serious math in it. But, you know, we were having fun. I mean, really, that's actually been the behind most of what I've done. Hey, why not? This is fun, right? And somebody else is enjoying it, so let's keep doing it. We're helping somebody even though we're having fun. Um, in fact, we had referees that wanted more carny talk. We had to keep going back and, and, <laughs> and adding more carnival um, lingo throughout the entire paper. And then we find out <coughs> it was translated into Chinese. <laughs> now, of all the papers I have ever written, this is not the one that I thought <laughs> Okay, I never thought any of my papers would be translated, but I never would have expected this one. Um, we can't read a word of it. Um, we can read our names. We can read where it was translated from the, the, the original article, and we can read the diagrams, but we're pretty much in the functions. Um, <laughs> at a loss beyond that. Um, <laughs> also, nobody expected me to be working with Beth. We decided to work together because we're good friends and we're on the phone all the time, and even though she's in Colorado. Um, but she was in complex analysis and I was in complex dynamics. And at least the first word's the same. <laughs> <laughs> but we started looking at questions about what the graph of a complex function would look like. And that would be four dimensional, so that's kind of a problem. Um, and what we ended up doing then was looking at contour plots of pulling off the real and the imaginary parts of iterates of some of these functions and just looking at them. And, and so here's, here's just an idea of what we saw. This is uh, contour plots for the, so z squared, z squared, plain boring function. We iterated six times and pulled off the real parts and the imaginary parts. It's a surface, like in Calc 3. So these are contour plots of it. And that was the Julia set. Okay, so let's do another one. Here's z squared plus i. There's your contour plots and there's the Julia set. Um, and then uh, here's another one. Um, um, it was like one of those things that make you go, hmm. Um, so we started asking questions about the pictures and what they mean, and we ended up proving some basic properties for z squared plus c, so the quadratics. And um, I presented it at an MAA meeting because we had some results. I can't say they were deep, but they were results. And two days later, a graduate student um, emailed me and said, you know, I think I know how to extend that. And we're like, Great. Well, actually, he was um, one of John Meyer's students. John Meyer is one of the people, the guy who asked for a preprint from me a long time ago. Um, so we invited him to join us. And uh, shortly after that, I had the opportunity to be a visiting professor at the Air Force Academy. It helped that they knew me um, when I applied. I'm right here. Beth is standing right in front of me right there. Um, it was definitely an interesting experience. Um, my students stood at attention at the beginning of class. <laughs> and said, ma'am, class is assembled and ready to learn. And then they, and then they sat down and pulled up Facebook. But <laughs> not all of them. They were, it was ab absolutely a great experience. Um, but that year when I was at the Air Force Academy, there were some very interesting things that happened. First off, Brian Winkle was the other visiting professor. He was the, the editor of Primus. Um, and that was, his office was next to mine. We both had this incredible view. <laughs> And remember, I like hiking. This is standing at the top of Eagles Peak. That's the Air Force Academy right there. So this is the view we saw from our office, and that's looking back on it. It was a great year. <laughs> um, Beth and I had time to work together. We invited Clinton to come out and work with us, and so that we got a publication out of it. That was the, the real and imaginary part stuff. And for the fun of it, Beth and I took a meteorology class. Why not? 
<laughs> we should always be learning things, right? Um, but because I met Brian Winkle, he was a civilian at West Point, he invited me out to West Point and I did a teaching workshop at West Point. So they're doing a cylinder here and, you know, feather boas. Um, I sound like a broken record here. <laughs> you know, of course we use feather boas, right? Um, also because of him, he, told, he introduced me to Elizabeth who was a postdoc there and she does complex dynamics. So we had to meet somewhere. So we went to a nearby art museum that was an outdoor sculpture thing and we you know, picked on the tacky sculptures and talked about math. And she showed me this really cool picture and so we ended up calling Beth, who was in Colorado, with, you need to graph this function. We left this voice message on her phone. We called her later and she's like, yeah, I wrote the equation down on, my, on the whiteboard on my refrigerator and I'm typing it in right now. Um, and it was really cool. So, <laughs> um, so she ended up working with us. Um, we met at West Point once and we outlined a paper in a, their classrooms have chalkboards on every wall. And so we stood in the middle of the room and outlined the entire paper. And, and then we were like, oh, well, if we say this, we have to say this over there. And so we went, you know, and then we took photographs of all the, the panels and um, you know, transcribed it and worked on the paper. Um, and then, of course, we were doing drafts at the joint meetings, and that was in San Diego on top of the roof of a hotel next to a pool. So we've done all sorts of research in interesting locations. Um, and so this is the picture that we saw when we were playing with Elizabeth's functions. She'd been studying this Julia set, which is um, quite interesting in its own right, and our real and imaginary parts ended up doing something interesting with that as well, and our results did extend to her case. Um, because of Brian Winkle, I also met Jessica Libertini, who was doing a postdoc at West Point. At the time, she's at Rhode Island now. And the two of us have led some sessions at the joint meetings on tactile, hands-on teaching ideas. Um, and then we guest edited a Primus issue because of our sessions at the joint meetings. And then because of that, now we're working on a book project related to it. And if any of you do hands-on teaching ideas, please let us know, because we do take submissions for this. Um, and now I'm on the Primus editorial board. So it, everything just kept cascading on itself. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is that because of that meteorology class that Beth and I took, because why not, it was interesting, we wrote an article about the math in meteorology. It's Calc 3 level. And um, this just came out this month. This is in Math Horizons. Um, and we wrote it, co-authored it, or tri I don't know, there's three of us, with the, uh, with the meteorologist that we took the class from. And um, anyway, so what are my final thoughts on it? Because I know no career is going to be the same as mine, but you do want to keep your eyes open to new possibilities. I would not have predicted anything I told you here. I thought I was going to go teach and try to publish. That's what I thought, <laughs> right? Um, and find what you love about the profession. Find what you do, what, you, what makes you happy and what you're good at and helps others at the same time um, and, and go with it. And also apply for Project Next. <laughs> and finally, remember you're alive, right? You're alive. So, so don't, don't, obviously you're not a rock, but don't hide under a rock. Let everybody know what you're doing and uh, get your name out there. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>